Somebody up here should be wearing a hoodie. Uh, young, black, and brown men are being followed, being shadowed, being stopped and frisked, stalked and murdered, all under the auspices they look, because, that they look suspicious because they were wearing a hoodie. Well, if that little boy, Mark, uh, what's his face, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, can wear a hoodie and be called a fashion plate behind the Unabomber and 150 years of Ku Klux Klan people wearing hoodies, when they tell you that they stalking our young men because they wearing hoodies, somebody is clowning themselves and trying to clown you. It's not a hoodie that has stigmatized our young men. In their perception, our young men have stigmatized the hoodie. It is, it is being black and brown that they have a problem with, not the hoodie. So I thought today that we should have to look at that straight on because we could end up going through the whole uh, Martin Luther King uh, dream speech and not see one re run reference to a hoodie. But that's part of the reality that we have. Correcting that has to be part of our dream today. Uh, I am always struck when the question is raised, how close are we to achieving Dr. Martin Luther King's dream? Because you see, Dr. King's dream is not something sitting out there, up the road, like a highway marker or a sign reading, we have arrived. Dr. King's dream is not static, some projection or, or wish list frozen in time. Let me get this. I it's a no, moving I, vision, I'll find like you. frames I'm, I'm of an epic okay. saga that tells yeah, the just, story of an right dream. As Dr. King said, his dream is rooted in the history and ongoing evolution of the American dream. Dr. King's dream is a dream for changing times. It was this ongoing, inextricably intertwined evolution of his dream with the American dream that he spoke of on August 28, 1963. His words from that day echo across the decades, words that implored this nation to live up to the meaning of its creed and to divest itself of its crippling human relations contradictions and injustice. While too often, when the media focuses on the substance of Dr. King's dream at all, uh, that is, when they focus on anything beyond the declaration, I have a dream, they tend to limit their references to the progress and fortunes of black people, to the question of progress in black-white relations. That's what uh, the question uh, uh, alludes to uh, when they ask, how close have we come to achieving Dr. King's dream? You can look for somebody black sitting on a uh, uh, television set and they're asking this person, how well off are blacks today compared to when Dr. King spoke? But Dr. King's dream was of an American where, quote, all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country, tis of thee, sweet, sweet land, land of, of liberty. liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims cried, from every mountainside, let freedom ring for everybody, for all of God's children. This runs throughout the dream. So while Dr. King specifically spoke of a day when his four little children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, while he spoke pointedly of a day when the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners would be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood while he drew a vivid portrait of a day when little black boys and little black girls would be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers, he was no less adamant in declaring that his dream was of an America 
that embraced and secured freedom, justice, and equality for all of God's children. He kept coming back to it. This understanding is particularly important because Dr. King spoke of all of God's children against the background of a civil rights movement and a march on Washington where the leadership was severely split on issues of the status and rights of women on the issue of gay rights. It was also the case that the challenges faced by Cesar Chavez and the farm workers were not seen as integral to the civil rights struggle, but as separate and insular, as something going on in the countryside of American society. In consequence, there were no Latino speakers headlining the March on Washington. There were no women who were given prime time speaking slots at the 1963 march. The martyr Medgar Evers' wife, Merrily, prepared a speech, but never made it to the podium to deliver it. It was simply assumed that in addressing the race question, the black-white question, gender issues would be automatically addressed as if women had no reality or